The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them to your strength, to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. Till your people, Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. This or the Lord will reign forever and ever. Please open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. And I'll ask you to follow along as I read just a couple of verses, and then we'll pray together. Chapter 12 and verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of this house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, how much we need a touch from you today, a visit from you today, how we need our eyes opened and our hearts warmed by your word, how we need to see and to know the work of Jesus Christ in our midst and to experience the power of your spirit in our midst, all things that are beyond us but not beyond you. So I pray that you would be so merciful to this congregation today, that you would visit us in power, that you would open our eyes and our hearts and cause us to know all the more and to embrace and even some for the first time the saving work of Jesus Christ of whom these things speak. And I ask for that blessing in Jesus, our Lord's name. Amen. When I was a kid, there were lots of World War II era movies on TV because that war was relatively recent history when I was a kid. So in, in one of those World War II movies, I saw a small group of soldiers fighting in Germany, and they were making their way through the backwoods and the fields, and they're pretty far from their supply lines. And, and one of those soldiers stopped at a mud puddle on the ground, scooped up some of the muddy water with his helmet so he and the other band of brothers could drink from it. And that seemed gross to me, but it wasn't a big deal to me. That's what they did. That's the movie. But one day I was talking to my father about that scene. My father fought the Second World War. And, and Daddy told me, yes, that, that is exactly what we did 
on the ground in Germany. He said, I've scooped up a helmet full of muddy water and just throw a Halzone tablet in there and just drink it and go on. And suddenly, <laughs> the meaning of the movie scene was changed for me. Now it was much more plain. That, that mud puddle scene in the movie wasn't just good cinematography and good storytelling. It was a graphic picture of a reality. The reality was that my father drank filthy water out of a puddle in Germany. And he did that in order to fight for and to secure the freedom of his fellow Americans, people all over the world, and me. He did that for me. He actually did that. And I actually benefited from him doing that. Now that experience, I think, is analogous to the experience we may have based on our passage of Scripture today. As has been said, we're in the first part of our three-part series entitled Rescue, and we're considering a rescue foretold in the book of Exodus. In Exodus, we see God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt to set them on the road to the land of promise. Now, that Exodus story might fall on our ears as good cinematography, good storytelling, but in fact, it is a graphic picture of reality because the Exodus event is a biblical picture of a greater rescue. It pictures how God, through Jesus Christ, rescues the people of covenant promise from their greatest enemy. Jesus did that, and we can benefit from that. So I want to know whether you need to be rescued this morning. Do you even know what your greatest enemy is? This passage can help you know it and help you have the rescue that you need. And if you really open yourself up to the reality of these things, you're in a position to truly benefit today from what Jesus Christ did actually to rescue his people. The theme of the message, as I put it in your bulletin, is this. God's rescue of Israel through the Passover and the Red Sea is a foretold promise of Christ's salvation. He redeems his congregation by blood and frees us from bondage. Now, for this story to make sense, we're going to be looking at chapter 12 and 13 and 14 of Exodus. It's a lot of territory, but the story has to be put in its context. The backdrop, the context is the call of God on Abraham with a covenant promise. God called Abraham and promised to give him a land filled with milk and honey to make his descendants as numerous as the sands of the seashore, the stars of heaven. But just a couple generations after Abraham, through a lot of things, you can read your Old Testament, family rivalries and treachery, one of Abraham's great-grandchildren named Joseph was sold as a slave in Egypt. Two things came out of that. Joseph rose to prominence by God's blessing, and Pharaoh really liked him, and by God's design, Joseph's entire family, which means all of the descendants of Abraham who were included in the promise that God gave to Abraham, were relocated to Egypt. Now you fast forward 430 years, multiple generations. A new Pharaoh has come along. He doesn't know Joseph. He doesn't have any affection for the descendants of Joseph, of Jacob, the Israelites. And in fact, this Pharaoh has become afraid of them. That's because the Egyptians were holding the Israelites, the Hebrews, as slave labor. But the Israelites had grown to essentially outnumber the Egyptians. So in order to keep them subjugated and not let them get any ideas about revolting, Pharaoh made life hard for the Hebrew slaves. And that's what caused them to cry out to God for deliverance. We get a Hint of that, we, we hear a record of that in Exodus 2, I won't ask you to turn, but here's what the Bible says. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So when it says they cried out for help, it means they invoked the promise God had made to their forefather, Abraham. 
Bring us out of slavery and into a land of our own. Make us free. Give us our own life. That's what it means that they cried out. And when it says God heard, God remembered, God saw, God knew, those all mean the same thing. God was faithful to his covenant promise. He took action to rescue the people of his promise. That's why God raised up Moses. He was sent to rescue the people of God's promise and deliver them into the fulfillment of that promise. Now, in Exodus chapter 12, where we're looking, we're at nearly the end of Moses' attempts to get Pharaoh to relent from his intention to keep his slave labor and to let God's people go. That's right there is where we enter the story. Now, I want you to listen, beginning in chapter 12, as you read a few verses and see what's going to happen here. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if a household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. And if you drop down to verse 12, we'll continue. God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Well, this is the tenth plague. Moses had enacted nine others, and it's the death of the firstborn. God himself would pass through the land as an angel of death that night. He would kill the firstborn of man and beast in every household, except any household that had the blood of a sacrificial lamb on its doorposts and overhead lintel. Those households God would pass over. What are we learning here? Well, I want you to take note the Bible is telling us that death is deserved by idolaters. Take note that he says this is going to be a judgment on all the gods of Egypt. You have to let that phrase have its full meaning. The gods that Egypt worshipped were gods of their own invention, false gods. A judgment against the gods of Egypt is actually a judgment against the idolaters of Egypt, the people who worship those gods. Anybody who does not worship the one true God is worthy of death. Don't miss an important implication of that. God did not say to Israel, I'm going to judge those idolatrous Egyptians, but you guys are fine because we all know what great worshipers you are of me, the one true God. He didn't say that because there was not a soul in Egypt, Hebrew or otherwise, who was worthy of being spared from the just judgment of God against idolatry. Nobody should be spared. But this is about God's rescue based on his promise. It's not as though Israel deserved to be spared because they were good, but Israel was about to be blessed with a rescue of God's promise. And that's not speculation on my part. It's a necessary inference from the deliverance. because The message was, you are all marked for death. You're all worthy of it. But I will pass over anybody marked by this blood. If they were innocent parties, they wouldn't need to be marked by blood to be passed over. They'd just be passed over. But they're not innocent parties. Guilty parties need to be marked out by blood so they can be passed over. So, there's a promise of life going on here. In verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you. No plague will destroy, befall you to destroy you when I strike Egypt. God is promising to rescue anybody who's marked by the blood of a lamb. It's a message of simple substitution. I want you to be able to see it. Blood stands for death. You know that. 
The lamb is killed. Its blood is the sign of its death. So this household deserves death. But when God sees that blood, he will accept that death instead of the deserved death of the occupants. One life for another. One death for another. It's a simple message. So the Bible records that they did as they were instructed. Every household of Hebrews in Egypt killed a Passover lamb. They put the blood on the doorposts and lintels. They observed the Passover feast, which was a symbol of the rescue about to happen to them. And that night, the Bible says God did as he said. He passed through Egypt. He killed all the firstborn. A great cry went up in Egypt. But he passed over Israel and spared them from this judgment of death. Now, we, we have to take note of some of the particulars that the text shows. It's in, it's in verses 5 to 50, chapter 12. I'm just going to scan over it. You can read that. I'm not going to read all those verses. But there are several things. One is that these families were identified with the lamb. They were told to take the lamb on the first of the month and keep the lamb until the 14th of the month. Now, I can assure you, Anecdotally, as a father of five children, as a man who has lived among dairy farmers and has eaten the beef that comes from the cows that they decide they need to slay, those families got comfortable with that lamb in those two weeks. The kids probably named it. The point, though, is not sentimentality. Don't misunderstand it. It is a symbol of identification. Later in Israel's worship, the sacrificial lamb will have hands laid on it. A sign of identification. But in this case, with the Passover, they lived with it for two weeks. And then they all got together and killed it. This would drive home the notion that this death substitutes for my death. And these people were to be marked by blood. The blood on the doorpost was about as graphic of a revelation as you could ask. The blood marks out my household as a household that has already suffered the death that's due. No more death is needed here. Thank you very much. The quota is filled full. We're blood marked. And again, they were instructed to be expectant of an imminent deliverance. The Passover feast helps us see the entire Exodus event as a single rescue with a few stages. The feast is very forward-looking. They were supposed to eat the entire lamb, burn up everything that was left over. The message is partly the sacrifice is entire. That's a part of the message. But another aspect is when we leave town, we're not leaving anything behind. We're out of here. And they were supposed to eat it in haste. The Bible says they're supposed to be fully dressed with their sandals on, holding a staff in their hands, and eat it in a hurry. The message is we're almost out of here. We're ready to roll. All that's needed is for this death to take effect, and we are on the road. And it was a death, a rescue, never to be forgotten. The feast was implemented and commanded to be observed in perpetuity. The message is, this one event is never to be repeated, but it's never to be forgotten. It will remain the defining event of your new blessed life. They were marked out by being unleavened. You know, in the feast, they were told to eat only unleavened bread for a week and for a week after that. Part of the meaning goes along with the haste. You know, there's not enough time even for the bread to rise before we're out of here. But there's further symbolism than that that's very important. The yeast is very often in the Bible, not always, but very often, a symbol of infectious evil. They were supposed to leave the yeast of Egypt behind as they traveled to the promised land, the land full of blessing. The message was one of purification, of separation, new beginnings. And you must take note that this rescue belongs to the congregation of God. Verse 3 says it was given to all the congregation of God. No Egyptians need apply. This Passover observance, the blood and the feast and the rescue they represent, they belong only to the people of God. That means the people who possess the salvation promise of God, conceived of as a whole, one whole congregation. Anybody who would not observe this, 
the text says, would be cut off from the congregation. And later, when Moses, as instructed, reiterated the perpetual institution of this feast, the Lord told him explicitly, when you do this feast, no foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. If any non-Hebrew person wished to participate in what these things are about, he had to be circumcised and come in and become an Israelite. He had to be part of the congregation of Israel in order to share in the blessing of the Passover. So God did as he promised. A great cry went up through Egypt as the firstborn in every household died. Even in Pharaoh's household, they died. All the people of, Israel, of Egypt looked at each other and said, these people have got to go. We will, they said, and I quote, we will all be dead. And they rushed the Israelites out of the land, and the Bible says they filled their hands with gifts of gold as they left. Here, please leave town. Take my money. Get out. But that was not the end of the rescue because God had another point to make. And you'll see that in your outline in Roman numeral 2 as God makes a point about glory and about the fact that they have a foe that's too great for them and that he needs to break the enemy's power. So pick it up in chapter 14 in verse 1, and let's, let's follow the contours of the story here. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So here we've got what the Bible reveals to us is 600,000 men of Israel, plus the women and children, chapter 12, verse 37. So maybe, maybe two or three million people, maybe five or six million people, we don't really know ran away from Egypt. They did not run northeast right straight toward Palestine. They went east and maybe southeast toward one of those two skinny arms of the Red Sea sticking up. And God sent them that way on purpose. It was his plan to get glory over Pharaoh when Pharaoh hard-heartedly chased them down to bring them back. The Egyptians let them go and they changed their mind. And here's how that chase unfolded. Pharaoh suddenly thought to himself, what was I thinking? Letting all the slave labor go for free. He seemed to have forgotten that he was thinking about all those dead Egyptian firstborns. And, and Pharaoh chased Israel, it says, with a hardened heart. Now the Bible very interestingly says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart in all this. It also very clearly says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. All I want to say about that today is that both God and Pharaoh agree. Pharaoh has no love for God and no fear of God and no compassion for the people of God. And God will get glory over Pharaoh. So Pharaoh's army of chariots, think of them as the tanks of the day. And the infantry, they chase after Israel. I don't know how many soldiers Pharaoh had. I just know it was enough to make 600,000 men of Israel feel like they were trapped between the devil and the deep blue sea when Pharaoh's army caught up to them. It was obvious to them that only a divine intervention would save them from death. That's how they felt. So Israel draws near the Red Sea, and they have nowhere to run. And pick it up in chapter 14 and verse 10, and we'll, we'll hear a little more about this. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, it is, be is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. 
For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. So what's going on? We see that this congregation is threatened by a foe that's far too great for them. And God is going to be glorified in breaking the enemy's power. That's how the story unfolds in verses 15 and following. It says that the Lord told Moses to hold up that staff, which he had held up to divide, to uh, uh, perform other miracles. Hold it up and divide the Red Sea so that Israel could pass through the water unharmed. Then God moved his own presence. He'd been traveling in a pillar of fire and a cloud, and he went from in front of them to behind them and took up the position of a rear guard so that all night long no Egyptian soldier could get near any of the Israelites. So in the miracle, the, the Bible says the wind pushed the water back so that there was a wall on the left hand on the right hand side, a wall of water, and the mud of the seabed dried up. The whole nation, the whole congregation walked through that water on dry land and came out on the other side safely. And then God let the Egyptians have a try. Because after Israel had passed through the water, God permitted the Egyptians to try and chase them. They drove their chariots out there into the middle of the Red Sea, but the Lord caused their chariots, the Bible says, to ride heavily and get mired in the mud. It's not so dry anymore. The Egyptians panicked, and it says they realized the Lord was fighting for Israel and against Egypt. They attempted to turn back, but it was too late. The Lord commanded Moses to stretch out his hand, and the Red Sea returned to its course. The Egyptians were consumed by the flood, and not one of them escaped. When the waves had settled, many had sunk to the bottom. But the Bible says the Israelites could also see dead Egyptians littering the shore. And in that way, Israel was delivered in great power from their great enslaving enemy. Now, I told you from the outset that this stirring story is more than good cinematography or good storytelling. It's, it's a representation of a greater reality. This exodus and these miracles are a promise. They are a foretelling of the greater rescue still to come. And Jesus Christ is the one who brings the rescue foretold in Israel's exodus. The Song of Moses anticipates that. We read the Song of Moses in the scripture reading chapter 15, but it says to us, I will sing to the Lord. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My father's God. I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. You have led, verse 13 says, in your steadfast love, the people whom you have redeemed, and you have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. That's all covenantal language. That's all language of the promise. When the song of Moses reflects on this rescue, it understands that God has become my salvation. This event is a foretelling of the final, the climactic event, when God would keep the covenant promise to Abraham. That covenant promise was a promise of complete salvation from sin and death and the devil, the true enemy of God's people. This rescue pictures that rescue. The New Testament declares to us the same thing. If you were to turn, but I don't ask you to, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verses 1 and following, we read, we read this. I do not want you to become unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. The meaning is that the Exodus rescue and the wilderness experience were not the ultimate spiritual reality God had in mind. 
when he made the promise. They were types, but not the substance of the promise. And those types were given so that the people of God would learn how to respond to the promise when it finally came. That's what that same passage goes on to say. These things happened to them as an example they were written down for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. See, what Exodus foretells, Christ makes happen. And the Exodus story teaches us how to believe in what Christ has done. Christ makes it happen. He's the one that carries us through the waters of judgment. Isaiah 43, which was read earlier, reminds us that passing through the Red Sea safely while the Egyptians were judged by God, is just like Noah passing through the flood safely while the rest of the world is judged by God with death. And both of those events are just foretellings of Jesus Christ carrying his people safely through the waters of judgment, the waters of death. Christ himself endured that death in order to spare his people of promise. That's what 1 Peter chapter 3 means when it says that Christ's salvation corresponds to Noah's deliverance. Jesus carries us safely through the water, safely through the judgment of God, safely through that which brings death. And he does that by enduring death himself. That's why these famous verses from Isaiah 53 are so profound for us because they tell us that Jesus took the death. That's deserved by idolaters. Isaiah 53 says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Like all of Egypt. Like all of Israel, we were the idolaters worthy of death. But God, in the mercy of a covenantal promise, sent Christ to bear that death for us. His blood is the blood of the Passover lamb. That's, that's why the apostle Peter can put it so bluntly in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says to the church, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Yes, Christ's blood redeems his people, buys them back. Jesus is our Passover lamb in truth. And that is why Jesus Christ gives to us, to his people, the feast of remembrance. So that his death is never forgotten. You know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we, we are reminded how in the Gospels Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room to eat the Passover feast one last time before he went to the cross. And in an interesting confluence, he told them that this blood was covenant blood. He called it my blood of the new covenant. My blood of the covenant or the new covenant in my blood. And that they would, they would live by feasting on him by faith. The, the Passover and the covenant renewal, they, they conflate, they come together, they all resolve into Jesus Christ and him crucified. He taught his disciples to remember his death. Through that meal, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's redeeming death. The Lord's blood. And God, John's gospel tells us that on the very day the Passover lambs were being slain, Jesus went on to hang on the cross and die as the redemption of his people. His death is our rescue, and it is not forgotten. Tellingly, his death cleans out the old leaven for us. Israel was bidden to leave the leaven of Egypt behind 
as a foretelling of the reality that Christ would cause his people to come out from their sinful ways and leave behind the sins of this world. His death cleans out the leaven for us. Therefore, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. His death causes us to leave sin behind, to be cleansed from it. That's what Romans chapter 6 is pointing at and telling us about because it's reminding us that his congregation, his assembly is free from bondage. Romans 6 reminds us that we've died with Christ so that we may no longer be what? The slaves of sin. Just as Israel passed through the waters of death, marked by blood, and after that they were dead to Egypt, but alive to God's promise. So in Christ, we die with him, and we are dead to sin, but are alive to God's promise of righteousness and life. Believers in Christ are no more the slaves of sin, death, and the devil than Israel remained the slave of the Pharaoh in Egypt. The Pharaoh's power was broken. That's a once-for-all freedom. Never again could Pharaoh bind them and bring them back. Never again can the devil bind believers in sin and bring them back into sin's dominion. The people of promise have been rescued by Christ and are free. What a story. But what do you do with it? Well, since this Passover and this Red Sea rescue story is really an enacted promise, and since this promise, the Bible tells us, has now come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and the first and foremost way to make application of this story is to make sure that you are not left behind as a slave in Egypt. Don't die in Egypt, I would appeal to you. Do not die with all the Egyptians who perished. Just follow the metaphor with me. It isn't complicated. Back then, God held out an offer of rescue to his people to be rescued from their slavery and to be rescued from the impending judgment of God. Who were the ones who were rescued? They were the ones who heeded the warning, who believed the promise. <clears throat> if you're here today and you're outside of Christ, if you don't have saving faith in his name, then you are still in bondage. And you are in need of just this kind of rescue. Now, you may not feel in your heart like you're a slave, or maybe you do, but the fact remains, outside of Christ, you are a slave to the desires of the devil. You are a slave to your own worldly desires. You can't stop being who you are. You can't change yourself. You cannot walk away from sin because it has power over you. And you are facing the judgment of God, which means death for you. The death angel is poised to take you out for eternity. There's only one, only one escape from what faces you. Only one rescue is possible. Now, it won't do any good for you to try to avoid this judgment or to be free from this bondage by being a better Egyptian. You can try to do better from the things that have you under judgment, but it won't help. You can try to act free from your bondage, but it won't help. The only hope for you is to become a blood mark powerfully delivered child of God, one who receives God's rescue promise 
by faith alone. I'm here to warn you <clears throat> that God Almighty has set a day that is still to come when he will visit the earth with vengeance. Just as he visited Egypt in the days of Moses and the Pharaoh, <clears throat> so he will visit the whole earth for judgment upon sin. Jesus Christ himself will execute that judgment. And I'm saying to you, it will not be a day of mercy. It will not be a day of last chances. Christ will come with his sword to slay the wicked without mercy. Everyone who is not marked by the blood of Christ, the true Passover lamb, will be destroyed. The only people to survive this judgment will be those passed over on account of the blood of Christ. Now, how can you be marked by this blood? By faith alone. By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ puts the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts and lintel of your life. That blood marker alone will cause all who believe to be spared from death and granted life instead. And when you put your trust in Christ, he leads you out of slavery into victory. Jesus Christ will take control of your life. He will lead you on a path of righteousness. Just like Pharaoh, your former sins will not be able to hold you in bondage. Jesus will push back the sea of judgment. You will walk through on dry land. And not all the armies of the devil in hell nor your own wicked ways will be powerful enough to stop you from leaving. Your enemy's grip on you will be broken. And you'll be free. That means free to obey God. That means free to leave sin behind. That means free from the stranglehold of sinful ways to live free in the power of God. The power that raised Jesus from the dead will raise you from the dead and give you a new life too. My question to you is, my unbelieving friend, will you have Christ? Will you be rescued from sin and destruction. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Turn from your sins and trust in the Savior. He is receiving sinners today. I say to you, come to Christ and be saved. How else will we make use of the reality of this story, I say to my brothers and sisters, live marked by the blood. What do I mean by saying you ought to live marked by the blood? Well, the, the Israelites were identified by the blood on the doorpost. It marked them as belonging to God. Don't let the symbolism be lost on you as a Christian. The death angel, which was God himself, passed over the ones marked by blood. The blood stood for a death that had been died on their behalf. The Passover lamb represented the vicarious death of Israelites. It was as though they had died. They were marked as dead people. We understand that the blood on their doorposts was a symbol and a type of the greater blood that still needed to be shed. But the symbolism of being marked by blood remains. Now that Christ has died for your sins, now that you have put your trust in him, you are marked by his blood. <coughs> that means marked out as belonging to him, and it means marked out as dead. The Lord Jesus calls you to live a blood-marked life in this world until he comes. You must live as one who is identified with him 
who belongs to him. And to do so, you must live as one who has died. Can you see that? In the Passover event, the last thing any Israelite in Egypt would wish for was to be mistaken for an Egyptian. His whole life and his prosperity were fully wrapped up in the victory of God and in his right to share in it. Nobody wants to identify with a loser. Do not, as one who has come to faith in Christ, do not ever suppose that you can identify with the losers of this world and live as one of them. You belong to Christ. And the world has to see that you were marked as his. Your attempts to fit in, maybe at work or school, they're misguided. You ought not to wish to be what they are outside of Christ and under God's wrath and impending judgment. Your attempts not to make waves are impossible. If you belong to Christ, then the world will hate you as it hates him. And listen to me on this one. Some of you, your attempts to keep the church at arm's length, those are misguided and contradictory too. You cannot go through this life trying to be only marginally identified with Jesus Christ. And you must accept that the centerpiece of this identification is identification along with the people of God. That means the church. I wish you could accept that, some of you. Christ has no other people than the church. If you wish to bear the blood mark of Jesus, you must bear it along with all the other blood-marked people of God. These are real people, not hypothetical people. Listen, you can no more claim membership and identification with the idea of church, identification with some invisible, universal, undefined, generic bunch of Christians everywhere, while at the same time ignoring and not embracing fully the real Christians gathered right in front of you. You can no more do that than you could claim membership and identification with the idea of marriage, with the idea of parenthood, with some invisible, universal, undefined, generic bunch of families everywhere. I'm pro-family everywhere. I'm I identify with spouses everywhere. I identify with children everywhere. You can't do that while ignoring and not embracing fully the real family seated at your own dinner table right in front of you. Just try that on your spouse or your kids and see how that flies. If you're marked by the blood of Jesus, you are marked out as one of these real people, and we're marked together. Only Israelites were marked by the blood. And all Israelites were marked by the blood in community. They came out as a nation. They walked through the Red Sea as the congregation of Israel. And that's the way it is in Christ. We are the church and not the world. Now, of course, we're gracious to the world. But we can't make them love us. And we can't try to be like them. we got to be identified with him and with one another. Now, it's also true that being marked by blood means you are free in surprising ways. And the, the cry, the call is not only to be marked, but live blood marked, but to live free. Live free from bondage. Now, what is the freedom you have? What is the bondage from which you are free? And how do you embrace freedom? You are free from slavery to sin. What does that mean? Sin is not your master. So it is not able to coerce you into doing what God says not to do or, or refusing to do what God says to do. Before you came to Christ, your fall into sin had made you unable to obey God from the heart and unwilling to do so. So even on your best day, with your best intentions, you found yourself not able to do the will of God from the heart. You're like a slave in Egypt. Now that Christ has set you free 
You have a different relationship with sin. Christ has freed you from sin's domination. He's broken that power. Now, I know I say that, and you're like, you don't understand. I am still engaged in a real struggle to do the will of God. I understand that. I'm not saying that's not true. Whatever you choose to call that struggle, I know you find yourself tempted or drawn to do things God doesn't want you to do or drawn not to do things God does want you to do. The words you say, the deeds you do, the thoughts you think. The Bible says that temptation comes from your own lusts. It's the devil using that. And if you're not vigilant, you may find yourself engaging in old habits shaped by who you used to be. So I know you act sometimes like the old slave to sin you used to be. You know that that first generation of Israelites who came out of Egypt were also pulled in the direction of Egypt from time to time, even though they'd been brought out in power. But the application of Christ's rescue is don't live like a slave to sin. You don't have to live that way. And you shouldn't. Your Blood-marked freedom means deliverance from your former master. Sin is not, in fact, your master. And you ought never to do its bidding. So as the Bible says, cleanse out the old leaven as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. I pray God give us all the grace to gladly bear the mark of the blood and to rejoice in our freedom from slavery, our rescue by Jesus. For his sake we pray. Let's pray now. Father in heaven, how we bless you for the rescue of Jesus Christ, who with a mighty right arm has led us out of bondage, marked by his blood and called us to a whole new life, cleansed from sin. Thank you for these things, for so great a deliverance. I pray that you would cause it to be all the more true in us and among us. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen.